Tracy Bartram, welcome back to the show. Tiffany, Tiffany Cook, Tiffany with the weird spelling. It's hey. very, it's lovely to be here. Tracy Ann Bartram. Yes, Tiffany Cook. Tiffany Ann Cook. No way. Oh, that's just right. Another thing. Just another thing. Are you an A double N or an A double N E? A double N. I've got plenty of E's in my first name. Thanks. Oh, I'm an A double N as well. So I, so many E's in your name. <laughs> so I, many. I always say to people when they put an E in Tracy, and so many people do. Yeah. And I, so if I get an email from someone like, let's call him David, um, I'll write back, hi, David, with an E on the end. I put Davida and I go, just giving you back that cheeky E, you're stuck on my name. I might be from Dandenong, but I'm, I'm an E-free girl. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. You know what gets me the most is when people do it on Facebook and I'm like, you literally have to look at me. You have to literally have to look at my name when you're typing the message. It's right there. Well, you know what the problem is? What? People are dumb shits. <laughs> <laughs> They are, which is probably why we just spent the first 20 minutes of our bloody chat, pre our preamble, talking about dogs because they're yes, not Yes, of course. Shits. No, they're, oh my God, no, they're not. No, well, I, you know, I, I was sharing with you that it's been a year since my little Jasper got his rainbow wings and uh, I, I mentioned this, um, I will discuss it with you because it's very much top of mind for me because I'm trying to find a, a, a brother for my remaining dog, Meggie, because they were a bonded pair. Mm. And um, and he was attacked by a dog. I won't mention the name, but the breed, because I don't want to be breedist. <laughs> Very but, PC of you. Uh, yes, well, because because people, you know, people are weird. I mean, God, oh, don't get me started on vegans, but that's a whole other podcast. <laughs> But um, I don't, because I'm very veganist, but I won't go into it now. But, um, you know, my dog was attacked at, at the at a park and um, and he ended up, as it turned out, um, cancer starts in trauma cells. Oh. And which is why, um, and I was told that by, by my therapist, who then had the tenacity to die at the start of this year. So how rude is that? But it's she, very inconvenient. I know, but she would think it's funny that I'm talking about her because she was great. But she said to me, we know scientifically um, it's been proven that cancer does form in trauma cells, which is why a lot of, a lot of um, females who have been sexually abused end up getting things like ovarian cancer. So it, it just, yes. it makes sense because yeah. the body remembers everything. So, so poor little Jasper ended up, you know, with, with cancer, in, at, it started where he was attacked and it went into his mouth and we couldn't work out what was wrong with him. And um, it was, yeah, it was a really hard day and he's been gone a year. And what's happening is that Maggie, who was on medication for six months and then I weaned her off it, yeah. she's um, my housemate. I didn't know this was happening, but my house mate told me when I went out last week um I'm still talking about the fact that I went out last week <laughs> <laughs> I told Harps about deal. it I'm it's still, a big deal it's a huge deal yeah and uh but I, he, when I got home he said Maggie just would not settle he, she he said I had to go to bed and I left the door open so she could get on my bed and she was all over the place and he said and then she went out the back in the back garden and just sat there and howled and I just cried oh. Tiff so I'm pulling out oh, pulling out all the punches to see if I can pulling out all the stops to see if anyone knows a rescue a little rescue dog that needs a home but I, I showed you a picture of a dog whose name will remain a secret that someone's messaged me about today through my um my chosen charity starting over dog rescue and, he's so, and uh, he's so gorgeous but you know there's always a cue for people so I'll let you know I'll let you know next time we talk well I I'll let you know wait. as, as well, soon as I know I will let you know <laughs> so I want to come back to dogs briefly but also first want to say how amazing the human body is so I yesterday uh, yesterday was it yes yesterday no the day before managed to slam my thumb in the car door. Oh, God, it's so painful. It was so painful. And I thought I'd broken. Like, I went dizzy of for, for about 15 minutes and was like, ugh. I Were you on your own? No, I was. I just pulled up. I was I was taking a PT session. <laughs> so my poor client, she the reason I opened the car door was to put in this beautiful plant that she'd given me as a Christmas gift and a thank you. And I put it in there and I turned around and I shut the door and I was kind of, I don't know, you know, just going tiff pace at life. And the thumb was in the door and it was just oh. like, yuck. Anyway, I went to the chiropractor. I've been going to my chiropractor weekly, which I hadn't been for probably a year. And he's amazing. Shout out to Christian Varney. He's been on the show like at the very beginning. Amazing guy and amazing treatment methods. 
I don't even call him a chiropractor. He's just like a, this brain neurology whiz. He does a lot of a lot of study around functional neurology, so the mind and the body and performance and efficiency. So really, I go there and I pay to have a chat with him, and he just happens to fix my body while I'm there. Got it. But we go, and I've been going uh, weekly because I've got all my health fund to use because we've been in lockdown. So I was like, oh, I'll just go weekly, and I feel amazing. But I go last week. And after that, or yesterday, or whenever, what I say, I don't even know what day it is. No one does. It's a bl- it's Blur's day. <laughs> yeah. So he's clicking away, right? He's got his little dash. He's click, 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 click. A lot more clicking Ooh. than normal. And I'm like, ah, oh, you're doing a lot of clicking there. Am I in a bad way? And he's like, well, you know, the body trauma is stored in your nervous system. So you hurt your thumb, and you have this knock on effect, and it's stored in your neck, and it's stored in your body. And you know, we're just. Re- and I was like, isn't that fascinating that I can jam my thumb? And he goes, even was just talking about how this minor things, even when we try not to, all of a sudden our mechanics change to accommodate this. You know, you start opening, unlocking the door with your opposite hand for a while, and just all of these little minute changes and. It really fascinates me. Yeah, sure. It, it, well, I had a, I survived a car crash. It happened six years ago. Mm. And when I was seeing an osteopath regularly until the TAC decided, yeah, you're not, we're not paying for that anymore. Um, in fact, we're not paying for any of your treatment anymore. Just just threw me off a cliff. And this is <laughs> this is the TAC that takes, what is it, over 50% of our registration for cars? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. It's a giant slush fund for the state government and uh, it's, it's a travesty. And I've been you know, dealing with them for six years. And my osteo told me that because I, I, I had severe whiplash from a guy, I'd just done a three and a half hour yoga workshop three and a half hours. I mean, this is my dedication to yoga. I started yoga when I was 14 yeah. and, um, and I was in Eltham uh, with my girlfriend. We just had this terrific afternoon and a guy slammed into the back of my car. I was, I was in the passenger seat. So all, all the pain has been on the, has been in the right-hand side, but whenever I've had treatment, all the damage shows up on the left-hand side. Yeah. And I don't understand that. I just don't. And I've had spinal blocks. I've had, I had a, a, a spinal cord stimulator put in to try and stop the pain because for six years I haven't slept properly. Um, you know, I wake up maybe six or seven times a night with pain and I won't take painkillers because they ruin your body. So I just, yeah. Yeah. I'm in a state of acceptance that this is how I live now. I, I've been single for six years and I don't think I'll ever sleep with anybody again because I'm <laughs> down like a bride it's naughty all night like I'm just I just can't get comfortable you know it's awful it's awful oh, yeah so look at us with our injuries you and your thumb and me with my screwed up neck yeah. oh and me and my everything normally but you know um, I, I always think if he didn't give me all of that fascinating brain body chit chat nervous system stuff that I thrive on I would I can understand why people don't go. He's not like your normal car, but he does. He very rarely gives me a manual crunch adjustment. He does Good. these little niggles, like he'll wiggle on something and he'll do a clickety click somewhere else and he'll poke somewhere and go cough and then he'll like drag his fingers down my Does he hold? Does he hold your testicles when he asks you to cough? <laughs> yeah, that's part of it, isn't it? He said that they're very big and healthy. <laughs> But I think to myself, if if I didn't, if I wasn't interested in the other stuff, if I was just an an average person that just went in to get this, it's no wonder a lot of people don't go to chiropractors. But since I've been going weekly, my body has stayed feeling amazing. Last time I went for a massage, the lady's like, "Okay, what do you what's what's tough? What do you want to work on?" And I'm thinking, I've been doing all this new tough training that should be knocking my body about, and I kind of was dumbfounded and went, "Oh." Oh, well, nothing, just whatever, because nothing feels bad. I'm actually feeling really good. And she moved me around a bit. She goes, your body's feeling really, like, mobility is great. And I was like, oh, wow, isn't that great? Good stuff. Christian. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. Back to dogs. What I want to talk about the dog, just briefly, because, you know, they make me feel happy. And that's Me too. The joy that I feel lately right so I've moved house so we no longer have a little courtyard out the front we've got a little balcony coach used to sit in the courtyard and just sit on the sun lounge and you've taken his you've taken your dog's courtyard away what a terrible mother am I judging you only a lot she's taken like every other priority in my life away from me so I feel like it's a fair trade 
Oh, uh, okay then. <laughs> when I take her for a walk and she smiles, like I will look at her and she's so happy and I just can't even explain the happiness in the cells of my body. Like, oh my goodness. And then we get inside and she'll just be like, Ugh. the saddest dog in the world again. I'm like, this is manipulation. It's like she wants oh, 24-hour dog walking but and you know I'm what? falling for it. They're so gorgeous. I remember when my dad was in a nursing home, and this is this is another thing that's wrong with, with um, our medical system here, because my dad had brain tumours and he had to live in a nursing home with really old people. And there was a young woman in a wheelchair in her 20s who was also living there because there was nowhere to put people with, with these problems because mm. we, don't, we still don't have facilities. I mean, they might be changing. Mm. But um, the nurse, the director of the facility had this great Dane. And I, what was his name? Riley. Riley. And once a week she would take him in to hang out with the residents. And they had the local paper. Remember the old days when we had local paper before Murdoch <laughs> screwed up everything? Yeah. And um, the local paper, you know, they came out and there's a picture of these three elderly women and Riley with his head on the couch between the three of them. It was oh. the most fantastic shot. And I said to, what's it, Jill? I think her name was Jill. Hello, Jill, if you're listening. And I said, why don't you have Riley here every day? And she said, oh, you know, I think that'd be a bit much. And I said, but the bigger the dog, the easier they are. They just, he was just like this elephant in the room, but everyone <laughs> loved him. He was so big and everyone just loved him. And I said, in terms of, you know, um, enrichment for him and, 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 you know, a loving experience for the residents, why don't you think about it? And I said, you know, they get terribly lonely at home on their own. And he was an only dog and, and, and Dr. Hugh Worth, who was the, um, the honorary president of the RSPCA for decades, maybe 40 years, he told me on radio once, he said that dogs and cats go through the same trauma as humans in isolation and that if ever you go out and leave your animals alone, leave the telly or the radio on yeah. for them so that they have yeah. that sound because it's not that they watch the TV but they can hear the voices and it's not so traumatic for them. And I've always remembered that. And so I told that to Jill about her lovely Riley and she said you know I I might think about it well she started taking him in a lot more regularly and within about a month Riley got sick she lived out the back of beyond somewhere down on the peninsula couldn't get him to a vet in time and he died of a spastic colon in the middle of the night but I said to her isn't it great that the last month of his life was spent around people all day long you know mm -hmm. because they're not at the dogs are pack animals. They mm. can't, they're not meant to be on their own. And what I've noticed with Meggie, particularly in lockdown and particularly since Jasper died, that she is with me 24 seven and it's, she's just here. I mean, I went to, before we started, I went to see if she wanted to come into my office because if she, if she doesn't know where I am, she'll, she'll scratch on the door the other day. I thought, what's that noise? And she locked herself in my wardrobe because I, she, she likes going in there and I've just slammed the door shut after I've made the bed and walked out. And I thought, what's that noise? It was Meggie going bang, bang, bang. She's only seven kilos but going, hey, I'm in here. <laughs> so, you know, they are a massive part of our lives. And um, I'm with a, gr a group called Starting Over Dog Rescue. And I did tell you something about a fundraiser that I'm planning to do uh, at the end of the financial year. And when it's set up, I will let you know because I'll I be doing it on my oh laughaholics podcast which is what we were going to talk yes, about yes yes we should talk <laughs> about that we should let's talk do about that one last thing one last thing on dogs it's and it's not a it's not an amazing thing but i was reading something the other day and it really captured me and i guess i want to talk about it because i want all the dog people to hear it and think mm. about it when that time comes because i've thought about that since the moment i got a bloody dog that they don't last forever and it was i think it was a vet writing a big uh you know thing about how because we don't when we had that time comes and we need to move our dog you know give the old rainbow bridge thing yeah. happening and facilitate that that people don't want to be in the room and because it's too hard oh, they no. were talking about how all the dogs do is is look for their owner to be that's there that's right them. and like i've i could probably cry if i talk too much about it so i won't but I just went, yeah, you know, I'm going to be strong. I'm not strong in those situations you have to be. a lot, but I'm going to be the strongest mofo alive. Like. You have to be. Look, I've got to tell you, 
I mean, my other dog, Moby, he lived till he was 17 and I talked about him on radio for a very long time. And um, he was living with my former husband when it was time to, oh, <laughs> I've just broken my own rules. There's my, <laughs> I never have my phone on when I'm recording and it's my agent. So I'll just send her a message and tell her that I will, um, I'll call her back. Yes. <laughs> Hopefully it's about that booking for International Women's Day. Thank you, Vicky. Um, but yeah, I, um, you know, my Moby had been left, he, 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 he should have been put to sleep earlier, but my former husband was like, you know, he's just because he's getting old, I'm not putting him to sleep. And I said, it's not about you. Mm-hmm. It's about him. And what happened with Jasper, my little boy that I talked to you about earlier, he's the one who'd been um, attacked by the dog. My lovely vet, um, um, Sol, who has Northcote um, Plaza vet, um, mm. I don't live anywhere near there now, but he's still my vet because he's just the best. And uh, and he, and he this was when we couldn't go into the vets. They were all in full PPE. Um, mm. And he told me that, you know, it was cancer. But it was interesting how he said it, you know. I said, because they all think there's something wrong with his teeth, Sol. Do we need to do some tartar scraping? And he said, no, it's not. It's not that. I think it's, I think it's a growth, and that's a kind way of saying cancer, isn't it? And I mm. said, ah, oh. you know. And I thought, you know, because vets have to be therapists because they're dealing with humans having a meltdown all the time. And and I was like on the phone, and I said, oh, a growth. Can we can we fix it? And he said, uh, I I don't think so, Trace. And I said, oh, mm. can we have some treatment? And he said, look. And I said, are you talking cancer? And he said, yes, I think I am. And I said. Well, can we have treatment? He said, Trace, he's 15 oh, years God. old. He said he'd never, he would never survive the treatment. And he said, and I, I wouldn't, I, you know, it just would be too hard for him. And I said, do we have to have him put down? And he said, not today. And I said, well, how, how, how long? Are we talking days or weeks? And he said, oh, I think weeks. Oh, God. Uh, yeah. And this was, he was just before Christmas last year. And, um, and so I said, well, when will I know? And he said, and so I want your listeners to know this too. He said, he'll tell you. Now I've had dogs my whole life. Oh, God. And um, so I said, well, make sure that I've got enough painkillers for him. And so every day he had half a codeine and every day he still went skippity skippity through the park. He still, it, he loved his part. He loved the run. And, uh, and then I had to go into hospital for some pain relief, a pain blocker. And when I got home, my son was here to look after me. And I said, oh, Jasper's weed in the hallway. And he said, yeah. He said, when I got here, he'd done done two poos, mum. And I went, oh, he's losing his mind. Because when dogs do things that they normally wouldn't do, and because he had cancer in his mouth, you know, we knew that it was, you know, obviously spreading everywhere. And I rang the vet and, and and he said, look, bring him in tomorrow because Max had to go to work and I couldn't drive because I'd had an anesthetic. And so I just gave him some more um, morphine and the next, uh, can, can, um, what did I call it? What's the drug I had? Codeine. Codeine. And the next day when I tried to pick him up, he tried to bite me. And that I said, okay, honey, I know. Now it's time. Now it's time. Oh. So he had his last codeine. He had 27 bones. I took put footage of him going rah, 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 with his bone. We took him down. He was full of life. He was, and that was the hardest thing. And my vet said, oh, look, I, I just really struggle to put down a dog who's so much, he's so, he's got so much life in him. And I said, soul, he's panting. It's a stress response. You know this. And he said, you're absolutely right. And so I had to hold my little guy's head. And normally when you're putting a dog down, they're already half gone. But to look, him, to look him in the eye and say, you're such a good boy. You've been such a good boy. And it was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. It was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. But, you know, um, I would never let an animal of mine suffer, ever. And so no matter what, you know, I mean, I, I ended a friendship. I'm going to tell you about this. I never planned to talk about this. I never planned to cry on your podcast either. But, <laughs> well, you've got me tearing but, up. So here's the thing. I, I was taught when I was very young that animals and children don't have voices and we need to speak up for them. So I have always been an advocate for animals and I've always been an advocate for children. And, but, you know, when vegans try to shame me for eating meat because they're vegans, I want to throat punch them and I'm a pacifist. So I'm just saying I'm an omnivore. Like all human beings in 2021, we got to 2021 by eating animal products of some description it's how our brains grew it's who we are so um 
I had a situation very recently, and I'm saying this because for those of for those of your listeners who may have ever listened to me banging on on the radio, I've always been very big on the truth and and standing in your integrity. Mm. And I had a situation recently. I will not name these people, but we've been friends for about four years and I went to visit them and they live on a big property and they've got lots of animals. And I was wandering around the garden with their two youngest children and we were looking at the veggies and what's that vegetable and what's that here and what's that over there? And, and I, they have an aviary. I hate aviaries. I can't stand birds being in cages at, at all, at all. The thing we love about birds is that they fly and we stick them in cages. And mm -hmm. cockatoos live for 100 years and most people don't know that. Yeah. And my friend Sonia, who's a, an animal rescuer, she's, she has a, a cockatoo called Bob who was surrendered by someone who couldn't look after him anymore. He's 35 and he'd been living on pizza. I mean, that's terrible, you know. So he's what? now, because people don't realise what birds need, you know. And so anyway, I was at this these, this uh, family's home and I, I looked in the aviary and there was a bird at the bottom of the aviary on the ground and I couldn't work out what it was and I thought is it dead and then I saw it moving and I raced up to the house and I said to the the male parent there's a real problem with the bird there's one of your birds in your aviary and he said oh is it the quail and I said I don't know what it is and he said oh it's it's fine and I said it's not fine and he said no no it's been like that for six months and I said then you should go to prison. And he said, what? And I said, I, I cannot believe what I'm hearing. If a bird's been in, in trouble for six hours, it's too long. And I said, this is what's going to happen. He said, listen, so-and-so, his intended, and her mother, who works at a vet, um, they're not happy with it either. And I said, well, this is how it's going to look. I'm going to take that bird with me and I'm going to take it to a vet and it's probably going to be euthanized tonight. He said, it's got nothing to do with you. I said, it's got everything to do with me because it's changed the way I feel about you right now. And that bird's in pain. And every time your children walk past that aviary, they think, oh, that's okay to let something suffer. And I said, you don't realise that children see those behaviours and they, you know, if, if you're cruel to an animal, it stays with you. 100%. So, that, so I took the bird with me. I rang Sonia and she said, bring it straight to me. We'll give it some pain relief. And when, she, when I handed the bird over, she said, oh, my God, it's got broken bones. <gasps> And birds have a thing called a cloaca, which is they do wheeze and poos out of the same orifice. I didn't know that until very recently, a couple of years ago. <laughs> so if you can tell someone you can okay. shove it up your cloaca, it sounds good. And I love that. It's fun, yeah. But this poor bird, this little quail, and I named him George after, after George Floyd because I, because I figured he was a, a little martyr bird oh. and that I wanted everyone to know about him, my little George the quail. Anyway, she said, look, let's, I'll give him some pain relief straight away. And he got a bit sort of sleepy and dopey. And then she said, let's give him a clean up. He had a, a, a piece of fecal matter stuck to his cloaca where he could not relieve himself. Oh and it was the size of a 50 cent piece, but a ball. And no. she cut it off. Yes. She cut it off and then she washed him. And she, she said, I'm going to pop him in a beanie. And I'm going to keep him overnight and I'll take him to the vet first thing in the morning. Because she said, I could take him now, but it'll be busy and there'll be bright lights. I just want him to, I, I just want to keep him warm and feed him. And because he's obviously been really traumatized. And um, she took him to the vet and they said that he had severe breakages in his body and um, he had toes missing. There were pecs in his head where the other birds had had a go at him. His wing, one of his wings was bleeding and he was euthanized immediately. And so I, so what I did, what I did was I contacted the couple and said, could we have an adult conversation? And I went round to see them that night, knowing that I would never see them again. And he got really antsy with me and told me it was none of my business. And she said, you're judging us. I said, oh, I'm absolutely judging you, completely and utterly judging you. Mm. And he said, well, wrap it up. You know, what else do you want to say? You know, you can leave. And I said, oh, I'll, I'm leaving. Um, so here's how it's <laughs> going to look. I'm leaving. You're never going to see me again. Our friendship is over. I don't want to be friends with people like you. And by the way, it won't be coming to your wedding. Have a nice life. And I turned around to her and said, you need to see a therapist because if he can do this to animals, he's going to bully all of you. And so that's how that friendship ended. And I rang Sonia and told her straight away. And she went, oh my God, you're so brave. And I said, I think that's what happens when you turn 60. 
you just go, I cannot be silent. But then I've been like this my whole life. But, you know, I just, I cannot be silent when there's cruelty to anything. But the fact that a bird was allowed to be in that much agony and he was saying, oh, I've been hand feeding it. I said, it needed to go to the vet. And can you help me understand why it had broken bones? And they were, no, no, is it possible that the children, no, no, you know. So, look, I just look at on the bright oh. side. I don't like weddings, so I don't have to go now. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a funny thing. I was I listened to an audio book the other day. I'm not sure why I downloaded it. I was at the gym and I was like, feel like listening to something different. And it was on trees. I can't remember what the book is or who wrote it, but it was about the life of trees. Like the oh, life the secret of life of trees. And yes. they talk to each other under the ground. Yes. So yes. I had a bit of a listen to that. And I was listening to the way that they communicate and the way that they, you know, talk about, you know, they warn danger and look after each other. They're it's amazing. Like, amazing. Not long after that, like the next week or so, I'm walking along and I'm walking past the local park. And there was, on one side of the road, there was a house where they were obviously setting up a kid's birthday party. On the other side, there was the park. And there was a couple of trees. They were small trees. They weren't big. They weren't sturdy. And they were tying this rope like a flying fox between the two trees. And I, it felt like I was watching them tie chains around a human. I was like, who are you to put that sort of pressure on that? It was so weird. Like, I'd, I had this new realisation that you t- don't do that to the tree. That's not just a, a piece of matter. Like that thing is living. Like you're so weird, isn't it? Yeah, but see, knowledge <laughs> is power. I've, yeah. I've, knowledge, once you once you have knowledge, um, you can't unknow something. Mm. And um, subtle stuff too. Like yeah. I've got so many plants in my house now. And when I look at them, I look at them with this deeper, not just an appreciation of that looks nice, which it used to be for me, like that looks nice, I hope I don't kill you, is <laughs> I look at it and I appreciate the fact that it's giving energy and stuff I can't see to my life. Yes. And I feel like this might be quirky and a bit woo-woo, but I feel like when I first got plants, they would always die. And then all of a sudden they stopped dying and I went, there's nothing I do logistically different with them, but I have a new appreciation where I just feel like the whole energy of the house, we get each other and yeah. now I feed them with that energy and people are going to be like, Tiff is a full weirdo. No, no, I completely understand and uh, because for me I've killed a million plants too and I've never really understood why. And now I have a, a you know, if, if you look at what Deepak Chopra says, in fact, in quantum, quantum physics, we are all one. Mm. It doesn't matter who we are, we're all part of the same universe so we're all we're all the same matter, which is why we've got a, we've got a virus going around the world, and um, you know yes. it's 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 you know it's there and we're living with it, but it's 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 traveling because we are we are all you know it's going to it's just going to keep moving. But in terms of what you were saying about the plants, I bought a plant in lockdown. Um, you know, I remember I remember going to pick up something from Office Works once, and I. I was sitting in the car and the guy brought the bag out and I went, thank you very much. And I cried like I just did, like I blubbed when I was talking about Jasper. And he said, are you all right? And I said, I just really miss coming into office work. Oh, I, really, I really like looking at the pens. And he said, <laughs> I'm a writer. And see, I buy my pens in, in boxes, right? Yeah. Like, this is this is what I use. I use a Uniball Gel Impact and it's... um. And they're, they're one millimetre broad and I've been using them since I broke my wrist in 2000. And so I buy them by the box and, you know, I use, I go through two or three a week because I, I, I'm i constantly oh, really? writing. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm constantly journaling and writing. And uh, and I had this big cry in the car park at Officeworks and the similar thing happened when I, I ordered, I went to Bunnings. My, I love Bunnings. And I, <laughs> and I really love a Bunnings sausage. And the first time we were allowed to have a Bunnings sausage, I sat right. there in the queue crying and I ordered two. Because I, I, give me another one, extra, extra onions. And I don't even eat bread, but I did. You know, it was just, <laughs> I'm celebrating by having a Bunnings sausage. And um, I bought this little plant. I couldn't tell you what it's called, but it was really little. And so I've got it in my bathroom. And what I've been doing is I've been spraying it with a little spray bottle that I got from Bunnings. And I do that every day. I just give it a little spray and I give it a little drink. And not only has it quadrupled in size, but there's a baby in there. And I'm going to take the baby out and put it into a pot and give it to my son. It's because I'm a tight ass and that's his birthday. (laughs) (laughs) But 
Max is 27. Thing. My son turns 27 on the 29th of December. And most people listening to that who've ever listened to me on the radio just go, hang on, wasn't he five a minute ago? Yeah, he's, <laughs> yeah. he's going to be 27. And um, every year I, I go, oh, what am I going to get him? But this year, this year I've been really consciously looking and buying and putting away because I've got Christmas and birthday four days apart and he's the only one I buy for because I don't have any friends. So <laughs> <laughs> not true, not true. But I buy things when I see them, when I think people will love them and I put yes. them away. But I don't buy things, I, I never buy presents for people's kids because they've already give, been given 10 million things. And so yeah. why would they need another piece of shit from me? So <laughs> I just... I just, I just avoid families at Christmas time. <laughs> I'm shocking at getting Christmas shopping done. And I'm the same as you is I hate buying shit. So it mm. makes, it makes me every year I go, I've got to be better at buying stuff when I see it rather than waiting till, you know, time you've got to, to buy. You've got to go onto the inappropriate gift company. Look at that website. Oh yes. That it's is brilliant. disgusting. <laughs> it's so great. <laughs> It's like the Craig Harper of, of, of online gifts. gifts. It really is. I hope they make millions of dollars because they're just so funny. Like really, <laughs> really, really funny. Yeah, I love them. Oh, I love look, them. speaking of funny, let's talk let's talk about the thing that we were supposed to talk about 45 minutes ago when we started the podcast. <laughs> I listened to your first episode with Shane Jacobson, the brand new Laughaholics podcast with Tracy Bartram. What a great show. Oh, thanks, Chef. That's really lovely coming from you. I really enjoyed it. I really I'm enjoyed glad. It. Now I get what it's like for people tuning in and listening and building this relationship with someone because although we've only had one other conversation, one other podcast conversation, I just connected with you and I felt like I knew. So then when I listened to you having a conversation with Shane, I felt like I was your mate sitting on the couch next to you guys just earwigging with a cup of tea in my hand. Nice. Well, that's the whole idea. That was the whole idea. I never wanted anything. I mean, I've never been anything but myself as a broadcaster. And um, I asked Shane to be my first guest because um, I love him so much and yeah. we never get to see each other. And I also knew that he would be um because well as he mentioned in the podcast a lot of comedians their performance is it and they're not necessarily mm. funny people whereas Shane and I both love to laugh and I remember once we were at the tennis not together we bumped into each other and I was there with the general manager of the ABC because I used to work there I still don't know why I'm not but I'm not I used to work there and uh I used to fill in over the summer break and I loved I used to do that uh, you know over I think I worked there for like, you know, 10 weeks a year. And that was enough for me to do breakfast radio for 10 weeks a year because it's grueling. And yeah. uh, anyway, you know, it was in the days before COVID, BC, and um, we were, I was in the in the dining room with the general manager. And I don't know why someone had given us tickets because they certainly didn't come from the ABC because you're not allowed to accept gifts at the ABC. It's a government agency. But uh -huh. for some reason, we had tickets and we bumped into Shane we were in the dining room and we, neither of us was interested in tennis we just sat there and ate our own body weight and food right yes. and so there was me and Steve the general manager and Shane and we were just it was like ping pong because we just we have this terrific rapport and we just laughed and laughed and I remember Steve saying he was he was very British Steve from Steve Kite Media and he said oh you two should be doing a breakfast show together and I just said that's never going to happen because Shane was already a superstar and he was so busy and why would he why would he decide to get up at four o'clock in the morning and do a show every day and have no life I mean he's an actor you know, but he's really, really funny. And he's, he really is genuinely one of the, the best humans I've ever met. And, right. and yeah, and I just, I love that story, the Crockett, the uh, Charlie and Boots story, which I won't tell you about when they were, because it's in the podcast, but when they were in the car and, um, and pulled up next to Myrtle. <laughs> yeah. yes. It's yes. very, very funny. In fact, my housemate, he was, the weirdest thing was hearing him sitting outside with his phone on speaker listening to my podcast and I kept hearing my voice and I thought what's going on he said oh I'm just I'm listening to to you and Shane anyway he came in when it finished and I was in here and he came and he said I loved it yeah. and I said oh that's great thank you so much because 
you know, you just don't know with a podcast and it's the very first episode and people are away and, you know, but I deliberately wanted to release it over summer when people have got time to listen in the car. Yeah, yeah. Well, I loved it and I can't wait. I think it's so, it helps a lot when you've got someone like yourself that can set the tone and make it really comfortable. So, you, you know, like you can go and hear people talk all over the place, but the, the listening experience is so important. Oh, it is. But interestingly, I was listening to the last episode I recorded last week and it came through from Daryl, my ed- my producer, and uh, I just went, oh, my God, I just did not shut up for the first three <laughs> minutes. I'm like, blah, 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 and I love this and I love that. And, blah, 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 blah. and I was just, and I thought, you know what? You can always tell when I'm stressed because, um, you know, I was recording it at home when normally I would record it at Daryl's place and that changes the energy and all of that and so yeah I just I and so I've I've recorded an an intro to go I'm just so sorry that I wouldn't shut up because for three minutes you don't hear them at all you hear just me going oh I love this thing and I love that thing (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah, I know what you mean about the whole environment thing been doing that channel 31 tv show and so we did a few at home but even at home my producer would come and film me. So he's there, there's lights, there's this, there's that, there's stuff going on around me. And it was hard to go keep pulling myself back into the conversation. And, and I've got this 27 minutes, or 27 minutes of content, not an hour, just to banter. So I've done a few episodes and gone, not only has it been harder when we then go into a studio, so then I've got a big studio and I've got all that stuff going on. And so I'm awkward and my mind's doing three other different things as well as being in the conversation. Then I'm like, all right, we've done five episodes now. The whole no plan thing, the whole no plan thing for a 27-minute conversation that's also visual isn't, I think, the optimal way for me to do this. I need to hit the ground running, which I've never done with my podcast because I just love this natural, like, cool. You know, for you and for some people, I'll write because I'd spoken to you before. I wrote down a handful of things that I thought would be cool things to chat about if if we if I you know got to a point where we're staring at each other going, <laughs> or if Tracy goes right, what are you wanting to do? You made me well, do my research last time. Well, you know why? <laughs> because the last time you said give me your wisdom, and I just thought I'll piss off. <laughs> Go and do some research, bitch. <laughs> How dare you, you little upstart! <laughs> you've been you've been up my bum, begging me to come on this thing, and, I, and then you said, "Give me your wisdom," and I thought, "Oh, no, nah, I'm not even going to talk to you." Normally, I would just I would have just gone bloop and hung up. <laughs> I think that's what yeah, I love really. most. I love the old reprimand. Bloody oath, you know. And so, in terms of you know, I will coach you here and say you must always be prepared, mm-hmm. and you've got to always remember that. You're doing this not for your own ego. You're doing this to to give something to your community. And the most important person in any podcast is the listener. Yeah. 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 It's always about the listeners. So, you know, is it engaging? Is it compelling? Is it boring? If it's any, if it's boring, stop it. Just stop it now. Should we we call it quits here? I think so. I'm bored out of my mind. (laughs) I I got to tell you, though, I remember when I started started listening to podcasts for some sort of research because people kept saying do a podcast do a podcast and I don't want to do a bloody podcast I don't want to do a, I don't listen to podcasts why would I listen to a podcast and I started listening just to random podcasts until people gave me the Fitzroy Diaries which I think everyone should listen to because it's just delicious okay. and uh, and Dolly Parton's America they were the first two podcasts I listened to and I right. was obsessed and when we were in lockdown 27 last year and we were on a curfew and we had to be home by eight o'clock I would go out at seven o'clock every night and I would walk my dog and listen to one or two episodes of the Fitzroy Diaries or Dolly Parton or whatever to get an idea but these are these are highly produced podcasts whereas mine is like the hour of power that I used to do on the Stereo network that it's a long conversation um, but with no breaks. And interestingly, episode two is Sammy J, who does the breakfast show on the ABC, uh, ABC Melbourne. And at one point he said, well, I'll tell you on the other side of the break. And I had to laugh and we kept it in, <laughs> but there's no breaks in a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it was really cute. He, he was trying to be helpful. And he was, I mean, he's gorgeous, but I just, I know, he said, will you use it? I said, oh yeah, we'll use it. <laughs> That's so good. That's another thing. My producer keeps going, I've got to put two, you got, two like however many minutes and I've got to put two ad breaks in Mm. and I'm like 
shit. Well, it I means had you... no training. I had no training. I had no idea when I'd done my first episode. I had no idea how to produce it, how to run it, how but to no edit it. no one does. Nobody right? does. No and one does. And now I'm like, how do I control someone? To... Like, that's why I've got to learn to plan. Maybe well, yeah. do a and... Tracy Barter of Intensive and learn some skills. <laughs> well, I was going to say, we need to talk about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we do need to talk. <laughs> you're like Tiff. You've had a year and a half now to play in the sandpit. Now you got to get good at shit. <laughs> well, you know, I think you're doing a great job, Tiff. But you know, for people listening, I do, I do media training for people who, you know, who need it. So, um, <laughs> and that's as she looks down, no, no, I down the lens not. at me very <laughs> gently. You're doing a great job. You've got lots of listeners. You, you know, you're very successful. You're on you know, channel 31. Who knows what Rove started on on channel 31. So, and that's know. the thing, though, is the idea that you don't know what you don't know. I remember, at the, you know, a few, two or three months in, I rang Harps and I'm like, all right, I'm g- getting a bit of a sense of where I'm, I'm feel, you know, the dust is settling. I want to get better at this, but I don't even know what is that it means. <laughs> like, and I still don't. And so it's like, okay, cool. I've had all this experience. The main reason I said yes to Channel 30, having a ten, Channel 31 TV show was, Oh, step right into discomfort again, be on a cat. Like that's so different, so different to be on a camera. It's so different to have people around you doing stuff. It's so, it's just another avenue that is challenging to me where I'll learn skills. I don't even know what those skills are, but I'm sure that I'm starting to learn what they are and I'm sure in time I'll learn them. (laughs) I'm sure you will. (laughs) Fingers crossed. You will. What was like when you did your with your first potty? What were your expectations? What were your what was unexpected for you? Um. Well, my expectation was uh, that it would turn out as well as it did. I mean, I've been doing this yeah. stuff for a long time, mm. so um, I did a lot of research on Shane, even though I've known him for a long time. So I think that's really important because. But, but, you know, I think it's important because otherwise, if, if I want to show a guest that I respect them, yes. I'm going to show them that I've actually done my homework because most people that I'm interviewing have been interviewed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. Yes. And so if you go onto a podcast and someone says, give me your wisdom, um, that tells me you have done no research on me at all. <laughs> and that's really um, insulting. <laughs> so, <laughs> because, um, you know, what's the point of me coming onto anyone's podcast um, if you haven't got a, at least a vague idea of my history as a, as a performer? I've been mm. doing this for, I mean, how old are you, Tiff? 38. So I started performing when you were six. Couple of years, you've been yeah. in the you've been in the game a couple of yeah. years. Yeah, and it's not about blowing my own trumpet. It's yeah. about if you want if, if you want to get the best out of people as a guest, then get them to talk about stuff that they might not have talked about for a while. And because you you kept hearing Shane go, yes. oh my god, I can't believe you know that. You yeah. know, so yeah, yes. I mean, in, in terms I, of yeah. to answer your question, my expectation was it, I wanted it to be highly entertaining like two old mates having a joke having a chat together and that's exactly what we got but it was better than I thought it would be oh I love that that's so good I think one one thing that I found as a strength for me personally and it wouldn't be for everyone and I feel like on some level hopefully it makes up for the lack I'd sometimes deliberately well not sometimes I deliberately don't often do very much research because one of two things happens one is I'm innately very, very interested and curious and very in the conversation. And I know that not all podcasters are because I've been on them where people don't give me that engagement and that feedback. And it's very hard to have a good conversation. So I know that that I do that okay. And when I know too much, I can be a real overthinker. So what I've found in the position I'm in is if I listen to another podcast then I might just start regurgitating I almost block the creative and the inquisitive side of me and the curious side of me because I'll start to regurgitate oh that's what I know or oh tell me you know it starts to get scripty so I would never I would never listen to another podcast to talk to learn more about a guest yeah Yeah. ever ever never never would yeah there's a million other ways you can find out things about people, yeah. but it certainly wouldn't be I looked up your OnlyFans page. You looked up my what? OnlyFans page. What is that? <laughs> it's like 
platform for X-rated stuff, Tracy. It's where people. It's like an Instagram for X paid X-rated. Oh my god! <laughs> oh my god! I didn't even know that existed. <laughs> you know, I was interesting. I was I was reading something yesterday. I don't know what I was reading, and something came up about Urban Dictionary. And the first time I discovered Urban Dictionary, I nearly fainted. I just went, "They do what with what?" I, I, <laughs> can't believe that the things that people do and the names they have for them like when I first heard about teabagging I just thought it had something to do with Lipton's and then I looked it up I looked it up on Urban Dictionary and I just went ew really ew oh yeah I think I'll stay single thank you very much it reminds me of I don't know why this popped in my head but it's just a term have you ever heard of the term dingleberries I have but I don't know why What's I don't a even jingleberry? Want to describe it now. It's well, you have to. What's a jingleberry? It's like when you do a number two and you've wiped your bum, but you've left a little bit hanging on, like the hair on your bum. If that's what a jingleberry is. That's what a jingleberry is. Don't don't people hear about moist towelettes that oh, you just God. you know, but you can't flush those. Sadly, not. My, I've got friend, a friend that works in the beauty industry and doing waxing. I just, I'm, just, she, I'm just recovering from just, saying oh. that the moist towelette. I feel like, <laughs> it's such a horrible thing. I don't even know if I'll be able to stomach editing this part of the podcast again. Yeah, take it out. Yeah. Take it out. <laughs> stop. Make it stop. <laughs> what was the thing about your friend waxing or is that disgusting as well? Oh, well, just, just the things that you wouldn't be – like they would leave moist towelettes on there when it's like, here you go, get yourself ready and come back in, and they don't use them. And there's – Dingleberries. Very big reasons for them to have – we wanted to use them like uh, – Oh. out. Oh. Uh, like I'd wash so much, I'd nearly wash my own skin off. Yeah, before same. Before anyone it gets around there. Well, see, the thing is, in terms of waxing, I've said this on stage many times in my map of Tassie's now map of Africa and spreading. I need a <laughs> I need a weed whacker down there. I'm not interested in in doing anything with wax. It's been so long since anyone's seen it, apart from me. That um, and th- that's a good advertisement. Hey, I'm single. But would you like to go out with me? Because I've, I've got like a, a chinchilla in my pants. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to say, I'm not very hairy. So it's not. It's not true. But it's a very good visual. <laughs> I remember once years ago, I tried to wax myself down there. Oh my but god! I pretty much had to leave the wax on and wait till that bad boy just grew out with the cells yeah. of my skin because it, I was like, okay, yeah. oh, we've come this far, but that's as yeah. far as we're going. <laughs> you can't do it. So I'm going to put out a shout out that if you know anyone single, straight, and over six foot three with no active addictions who would like to maybe take me to a, the movies, um, but not want to look at my chinchilla for a while. Um, <laughs> Because I've been single for six years and I've just decided to put an end to it. It's just got to stop. And I'm not going to go onto an app because they're brutal, oh, horrible. This is interesting. Oh, you need you need to you you need to talk to my new therapist, Bill. He's helping me through more of my issues. Oh, I've been in therapy forever. I told you my therapist died at the start of the year. So how rude is that? No, it's, I don't. I don't have any issues in terms of. It's just that I live in Melbourne. I have a profile. Men are scared mm. of me. It's just. <laughs> There's nothing to be scared of. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Come on, lads. I need you to step up and reach out. Thank you. Be a wow of a time. Six six foot three, single straight, no active addictions. That would be nice. Yeah. (laughs) And, yeah, and you've got to at least be, you know, within 10 years of my age group. I'm not interested in, you know. (laughs) I don't want to go out with anybody who does wear zip-up vinyl shoes. Zip up vinyl shoes. You so, see them in Kmart. Old men wear them. Oh. Yeah, with cardigans and comb overs. Yeah, goodness. Yeah. And also, here's a shout out. I, I love everybody, but I'm sick to death of short men who come up to my boobs saying, I love tall women. And I go, I don't like short men. I was married <laughs> to one for 17 years. I've done my karmic penance. Seriously. <laughs> I just really, I'm six <laughs> foot one. How hard can it be? And you know what? All the really tall guys end up marrying tiny, tiny, tiny women. And I just think that's wrong. Because <laughs> there's really so many grown, yes. There's so many tiny men and there's so many tiny women. Can't you just hook up and leave the tall people for the tall people? Really? Oh, so funny. I used to work with a couple on the spirit of Tassie and um What were you doing there? Animals die on that thing. I hate that thing. Mm. Oh, we better cut that bit out. <laughs> no, well, but 
they seriously. Do, yeah, a lot of bad things have happened on there. A lot of bad things, yes. I worked on there for five minutes. I did not last very long. I can't, I'm not uh, surprised. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so he was so, uh, just so, uh, so tall. I reckon seven foot, like super tall. And his partner, super short. And I remember yes. when they were having a baby, I was like, I cannot wait to see how I, when this baby grows up. What? Well, it will be, that, but they always take the dominant gene. So my son is six foot five and his father's about five foot nine now because he's nearly uh, 80 and he's shrunk. So, um, you know, when I stand next to Max, I look tiny. Yeah, when his wow. father stands next to Max, he looks like, a, well, you can't say it anymore. I was going to say dwarf, but you can't say that anymore. But, you know, a little person. A little person. A little person. <laughs> yes. It's ridiculous. Oh, dear. Is being a mum better than being a dog mum? Oh, completely different. Yeah. I love being a mum, but I don't see Max much anymore. I mean, he's living his life. And um, I think for any empty in, empty nesters, and I'm a moo, I'm a mother of one. And um, yeah. yeah, someone told me at the swimming pool one day when Max was having a lesson, this woman came up and said, oh, I love listening to you on the radio. And I'm a moo as well. And I said, what? I'm a mother of one. I thought, I like that. Yeah. But, but it's really hard because when they when Max left home, I mean, God. You know, I it, the grief is real. It's really, really, really hard. And um, but I'm over it now. I mean, Max, Max said to me when we first went into lockdown, "Oh, Mum, I'm so glad that we weren't living together. Can you imagine?" I said, "I would have loved it. I would just Jewish mother. I would have fed you until you exploded. <laughs> goes, oh, I would have died. And can, can you imagine being locked up for you know all this time? Because We've gone months and months without seeing each other during COVID times, but um, yeah. you know, I'll see him on Christmas Day, and um, you know, it was I always loved to see him. But I think the hardest thing for parents is that our kids grow up and they they want to live their own lives, and they're not that interested in us anymore. <laughs> you know, we just yeah, you know, I'll say, have you spoken to to your dad? And you go, oh, I've got to call him. You know, like. <laughs> And then, and then occasionally he'll ring me and I go, hi, Max, what's wrong? And he goes, nothing. I just thought I'd call. I go, oh. And then it's just like, but I go, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yes. How are you? What are you doing? Go to the gym. Da, da, da. And then, uh, but, you know, occasionally would, when we were allowed to catch up, we used to go to the pictures once a week. And that was like before lockdown number six. That was a highlight of my week, meeting yeah, Max. Nice. He'd come over, we'd have a bite to eat, and then we'd go to the movies. And then and now that we we haven't seen each other. He said, do we have to go to the movies every week? And I went, no, we don't have to go at all if you don't want to. <laughs> but I cannot wait for Boxing Day because guess what's coming out on Boxing Day? What? West Side Story, directed by Steven Spielberg. Oh, oh my God. I can't I wait. I haven't been to the movies for so long. Hey, when is your Anytime show- you want to go, anytime you want to go, we will go. All right. Well, let's pencil it in because I do love the movies, but I just never. Yeah, we'll go. I'll come meet you. Which show? What show are you asking me about? Um, the one that you're on with Les Twentyman's show, the one that got postponed. Because oh. I've got tickets to that, but my friend bought them, so I can't remember what date it postponed. Oh, till. that is – well, I've got a show next week, which is not Les Twentyman, and that's at the Golden Gate Hotel in South Melbourne where I'm singing jazz with the John Montesanti quintet. Um, and I will look on my in my diary to what tell time's you. that? Uh Doors are at six, I think. It's quite early. Um, yeah, it goes through till about 10 or 11. So when I'm just looking here, I think it's March. Let me just see. For Liz Twentyman. Did you, have you interviewed him, by the way? Yeah, I did. He was fabulous. What oh, he's an amazing man. He really, I'm so, I'm so glad that you did that. He's, yeah, thank he, you. He's, he's fabulous. Um, yeah, I saw him last week um, because it was, we were, it was like a fundraiser for, um, oh, God, what's going on with my calendar? Um, <laughs> here I am trying to be techno, techno bitch while I'm talking to you on a podcast to get you this date. Where is it? It is. I don't know. I think it could be. <laughs> I think it's, oh, it's the 20th. It's, it's February. It's, um, yeah, I kept thinking it was January, but it's not. It is Sunday, uh -huh, the 27th of February. There it is. At the Palms at Crown. <laughs> And um, it's quite a lineup. So I'm in seeing it. We've got um, Denise Scott and Charlie Pickering and Flacco and um, Elliot Goblet and a whole lot of other people. I haven't got the list in front of me, but um, and all the money goes to the Les Twentyman Foundation, which uh, I spoke a lot 
um, last week when I was talking to Craig Harper and um, because, you know, our, our youth are at risk and yeah. they always have been, but worse than ever. So, yeah. So come along to that if you can. Everybody yeah. get on it. Shout out to Vicky Turner Craig because we're going together and she was the one that, that said, let's do it. So Gorgeous. Well, that'd be good. Well, thank you for having me on today. And thank you for talking about Laughaholics because I am very excited about it. Well, it and is thank- very funny. So people go and subscribe. Thank you know you. that now on Spotify you can drop five star ratings and reviews, or not reviews, you can do five star ratings now, which is a brand new feature. So everybody listening that's a Spotify user, get on it. Yeah. Have you done yours yet? Of course. You lie like a flatfish. I saw. Look, I'm looking into your face. And I went, Nah, she has not. I definitely have. Have you? Yeah. <laughs> I love you. So that's I've so got gorgeous. one. I've got one rating, and Aww. I did it. <laughs> No, are you talking about yours or mine podcast? Oh, well, mine. Oh, you, you did it, it for you your said, podcast? Yeah. No, I I've thought you'd done, done, it. I thought you'd done it for my podcast. Well, I'll do it for yours straight away. All right. Well, I'll do one for you as well. How pathetic are we? How codependent? <laughs> I'll do well, yours if you do mine. <laughs> <laughs> like, like for like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're amazing. Hey, thanks so much. Everybody go and have a listen. Go and see the shows. I'm even thinking I dropped my mum off on the 30th back to the airport. I might see if I can rouse someone up and if I can get back in time, I might come and see oh, you at South good. Melbourne as well. It's You'd time love to the, get out. The Golden Gate Hotel um, in the 80s was the place to go for a candery on a Friday. And, and it was, it was you know, because I was in advertising in those days, it was just such a great place to be. And I haven't been there for a long time. But uh, the thing is because musicians particularly have struggled so much I mean yeah. it's look I, I wear lots of different hats and I, I happen to be a singer um, I don't play an instrument I'm completely reliant on amazing people standing behind me and making me sound better than I ever could um, but um, John Montesanti is an incredible musician and he has a, a band that's been running for 40 years called the Grand Wazoo and there's like 100 people in it and it's all mm-hmm. funk and soul and I had to say that very clear, carefully it's all funk and soul <laughs> and um but the he his quintet is traditional jazz players but I go in and sing pop songs with them with jazz <laughs> with jazz musicians yeah oh, so awesome it's fun yeah I mean I do I do I mean you know I I have a, 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 a mix a mix of a repertoire and it's got to be some because there's a lot of people who go who want traditional jazz, but I do a bit of John Mayer and a bit of this and a bit of that. So it's oh, a bit I'm of very fun. intrigued now. All right, yeah. I'm going to put my foot down on the way back to the airport and get around it. Well, you be careful because there'll be coppers everywhere. Yeah, that's what time true. are you dropping your mum off? I think that it is around mid-afternoon, so I should be home in time. I think that oh my I God, yes. for three three 3.30 or something. Oh, yeah. You'll be there. Good Lord. Oh, Come easy. meet me for dinner. Yeah. All right. All right. Oh, Locking I can't in. do that. I'll be eating with the band. <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll turn up and I'll go, sorry, I can't. I'm eating with the band <laughs> upstairs. I'll be peering through <laughs> my hand stuck to the window, snow squished at the window. Tracy. Can I be your friend? <laughs> Tracy, I'm Tracy's friend. We're you know best what? Friends. You should drag Harps and, and, and Melissa out. Mate, trying to get Harps out anywhere out of Ham- the thriving metropolis of, of Hampton. Hampton. It, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's become a shut in, hasn't he? <laughs> 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 to be honest, I can be pretty shocking at getting myself out of the house, but you know. Well, I'm... listen, the first 10 minutes of my podcast interview last week with Craig was talking about the fact that not only did I go to an event for the Les Twentyman Foundation, but I went up to Belgrave to listen to Tim Friedman from the Whitlam's. I mean, oh. I'm still recovering. Sonia, my girlfriend, lent me five of his CDs today, and I got in the car and I went, Oh my God, I love him. He's so great. Oh. So great. So oh. great. Love them. I've got to go. You've got to go. All right. We've been Thanks talking again, for far mate. too long. Mm-hmm. Hey, Tiff. Mwah. Big love. And, um, you know, big love and happy silly season and, you know, all that crap. Have a good Chrissy and I can't wait to see you adopt the next papa. <gasps> I'll be watching hold, socials. Hold that image in your heart because mm-hmm. I have a strong feeling that it could be the right one. <sighs> Bye, Tracy. Bye, darling. <laughs>